A turbulent and chaotic history hides beneath the soil in Western Victoria, and it's hidden remarkably well beneath the recently deposited sedimentary layers of the Otway and Murray Basin. We see only small outcrops of the ancient landscape that this area once existed as, back when it was a much more chaotic place. Volcanoes existed here en masse, from large stratovolcanoes to massive circular depressions known as calderas, which are left over after the largest and most explosive volcanoes erupt, with a few minor exceptions to that rule. But eruptions of staggering size occurred in this area, and tectonic collisions occurred time and time again. And within a period of about 200 million years, Victoria was slowly buckled and thrust up from the deep ocean floor episodically, with each part of the state slowly being raised one piece at a time, starting from the west and stretching all the way to the far east. One area in particular though is truly interesting. It's an outcropping of rhyolitic lava that was erupted forth after a massive eruption occurred here. But when this lava solidified, the formation of something truly precious and unique occurred here. You can find an abundance of geodes here, which are these incredibly beautiful spherical rocks that contain hollow cavities lined with crystals along with smoky quartz crystals, also known as the Morala crystals. The presence of both the geodes and the smoky quartz crystals have a fascinating origin story because their existence is tied with several huge explosive caldera forming volcanic eruptions that occurred in the early Devonian. These eruptions were quite large in size and they released a vast amount of pyroclastic flows depositing massive ignimbrite fields. And along with this, rhyolitic lava was also released after these eruptions occurred. Which, if you've watched our last video on Victoria's rift zone and the associated massive eruptions that occurred in the eastern part of Victoria during the early Devonian, cheeky plug, but the link to that is in the description below, you'll know that rhyolitic lava in this scenario is only extruded and released after a massive eruption has occurred which is necessary to depressurize the magma chamber to such an extent that this thick viscous magma is able to be released in its lava state, which is something that is quite rare to find rhyolite in. This thick lava is basically the magma that was left over in the magma chamber after the massive eruption occurred here, and so it continues to slowly rise to the surface and leak out following this, which is a trait that is rare for this magma. It is normally only associated with explosive eruptions, not gentle effusive ones like these were. Because of this, the geodes and gemstones here are unique and some are truly marvellous to glance at. The decomposing layer of rhyolite that these precious and semi-precious gemstones and geodes exist within are only exposed through weathered areas, or in areas that have eroded slightly around them. So these mainly occur as a small hill-like outcrop or in areas of natural drainage, and thus finding the source of the volcanoes that release both the rhyolitic ignimbrite layers and the associated lava flows has been impossible. Well, maybe not. I might have discovered a caldera or two, or ten, or more, as you'll see in this video. I use magnetics to peek beneath the sedimentary layers, so this video is also going to look beneath the Murray and Otway basins to try and discover some other possible calderas that are either related to or occurred around the same time as the release of the Rocklands Volcanic Group, which is the group that encompasses the Morella gem fields. And we'll also take a look at the many associated ignimbrite layers that occurred in this area. The treasured smoky quartz crystals and geodes have been highly sought after since the 1960s, when this gem field was first discovered. Good specimens could be found near the surface back then, but nowadays, holes are dug down to depths approaching 6 metres to find the really valuable specimens. But for those who aren't as fussy and don't mind smaller geodes or loose smoky quartz crystal clusters, 2 metres deep is usually the depth required to fulfil this desire, and it's legally allowed to be done in this area. I would love to head out to this gem field one day to make a future video, and try to dig down and find some good geodes and smoky quartz crystal specimens. So if this is something you'd like to see, please let me know by hitting the like button, and I'll add it to the list of videos that I'm planning on doing in the near future. The Rocklands Volcanic Group was released amongst a much older volcanic arc that was only recently discovered, known as the Staveley Arc, and I made a video on this, so if you'd like to see it, it's in the description below. But this ancient volcanic arc marked the first beginnings of Victoria's inception when it was thrust up from a deep ocean to dry land, 
and it, along with the much later released Rockland's Rhyolite Lava Flows, have been heavily covered up by the more recent sediments related to the two aforementioned basins. It's only by using magnetics that we can distinguish what exists beneath these deep sedimentary basins. And as you can see, we have just uncovered the deeply buried Stavely Volcanic Arc, and it is now in full view. So the Rocklands Volcanic Group consists of two differing layers, the Rhyolite Lava and the Intermediate Lava Flows. But what's striking is just how widespread the Rhyolitic version of this lava is. It's existing much farther south than just the Morella Gemfields. All the way past Wannan, with another section exposed at Bokhara. After seeing how vast the Rhyolite Lava Flows were, I knew something very, very big happened here, and this stretched way beyond the gemstones and geodes. There is a possible supervolcanic scale event lurking beneath the sands and sediments, and if not, then numerous large VEI-7 eruptions definitely did occur here, numerous times. These lava flows are just too vast in my opinion. So along with the lava flows we've just covered, we have all of these ignimbrite layers all over the place, many of which were a precursor to the lava flows that would follow the largest and most explosive eruptions. It's worth mentioning that the Rocklands Volcanic Group itself is composed of numerous differing eruptions, all of which have been lumped together into this group, which I assume is for the sake of convenience and understandably so because look at this area, it's an absolute mess. But we also have all of these independently named ignimbrite layers, which are the solidified remains of the once massive and scorching pyroclastic flow layers that were released by the now hidden volcanic structures dotted all around here. In this area we have the Negretta, Gadam, Glendinning, Cadden, Yatnat, and unsurprisingly the Morella ignimbrite. Now this is where things get a little fun. As always, this is all my speculation regarding possible calderas, but I'll offer my arguments and let's theorise a little. Take a look at this ignimbrite layer. The Glendinning ignimbrite layer stretches quite far, but at this location where this tiny bit outcrops, we see something that amazed me. Look at this. When we switch to magnetics, we see these circular shapes, and there are many of them. I really do believe this caldera, or one of the others that are near it, released this ignimbrite layer as it's the closest layer that exists to these structures. The possible caldera is completely covered up by the alluvium that's related to the eroding of this part of the Grampians. When we move south to Morella, we have this rhyolite lava that is associated with the gem field itself. Rhyolite lava doesn't normally travel far though, so it's common that it will be released right above or close to the caldera that allowed it to extrude, right? Well the magnetics might corroborate that claim. We have what looks like numerous volcanic eruptions of tremendous scale occurring here. I see three, four or possibly five caldera looking circles crossing over one another that are both small and large in size here, but what really strikes me is this large ring here which might even be this. And look at that near perfect circular feature just southwest of this, here. So now we know why this gem field exists. Something massive took place here. This makes me wonder if the rift zone in Victoria and the rhyolite lava flows that exist there contain geodes or gemstones of a similar quality. Maybe. But I believe in my heart of hearts that these are a number of massive calderas that released many of the ignimbrite layers that I have already mentioned. Now a little south of this and we have the Mount Mackesons Rocklands Volcanic Group Rhyolite Lava. And under the magnetics, surprise surprise, we have a massive ring shape here. Like massive. There's a possibility it was this big, with another eruption inside of it. I see three or four large circular features here, all of which could be large calderas. Now this is a reoccurring theme. In the southernmost section that outcrops over around Wannan, we have several distinct ring looking shapes beneath Wannan, Bullard, and Hensley Park. These look freakishly big, honestly, like I'm not even trying to embellish this. After all the magnetics that I've looked at, this looks like a massive supervolcanic scale event occurring here, or possibly numerous ones. But not everything is seemingly this obvious. In this little outcrop of rhyolite, the magnetics do not seem clear here. I mean look at this massive amount of volcanic rock, which I assume is primarily intrusive. It looks like one major ring might exist here, along with several other smaller calderas. 
I can't help but wonder whether or not those little dots in the far north are actually smaller stratovolcanoes that have been buried and maybe this mass of volcanic rock was once a churning magma chamber that fed it, and are now the solidified intrusive rocks that we see here. But when we move east to Vassi, we see the same reoccurring theme, rhyolite layers, along with some intermediate lava flows this time. Nevertheless, under the magnetics, we have what appears to be several large calderas here. Beginning from the bottom, we have what appears to be two large calderas, along with two or more smaller ones north of that. And north of this, we have what appears to be another one or two very large calderas, alongside one or two lesser calderas. Just west of this, we have another rocklands layer, and bam, another one or two caldera looking shapes, with a possible smaller two or more just north of it. So these shapes look like calderas too, but we have no outcrops. And if we move northeast, we see this massive array of rings. It looks like one supervolcanic eruption after another occurred here. We have what looks to be caldera after caldera, seemingly like a hotspot similar to Yellowstone was lurking beneath here. No outcrop exists, but come on, I'd bet money that these are calderas. So that's the fascinating and complicated story of this glorious present day gem field. It was formed by spectacular and devastating volcanic events that are at a scale of explosivity that is difficult to imagine in present day. It's a shame that the ancient land that this place once existed as has become buried beneath the sands and sediments of time. But at least we have these incredible tools to try to unearth some of Earth's hidden secrets. I believe this land would have been dotted with massive calderas, which would have erupted amongst an ancient volcanic arc that would have most likely still been standing when these gigantic eruptions occurred. Nowadays, the area is seemingly flat, but beneath the earth lies an incredible story of destruction and beauty, and I find that to be truly fascinating. Thanks for watching. If you found this video interesting or fascinating, then you're probably a little into earth science or science in general. I release new videos once a week, so consider subscribing and if you'd like to help the channel out, the best way that you can contribute and make a huge difference is by sharing our videos around first and foremost, followed by liking the video to let YouTube know we're doing something right. Thanks again for supporting the channel, it really does mean the world to me, and like always, I'll see you all real soon.